Right. So now we, we have a lot more uh, knowledge in terms of, you know, what kinds of uh, fragments we get in, in uh, proximal tibial fractures. Um, <clears throat> we also have the problem of lock plates because now lock plates seem to be something which will solve every problem. Earlier, the buzzword used to be MIPO, where you don't make an incision and uh, you know, try to keep your incision small. So most of these um, patients who come with especially varus malunion um, of the proximal tibia, they come with a varus alignment. Most of them that I get now have been from uh, arthroscopic surgeons, sports medicine surgeons, where these patients have been sent for an ACL uh, laxity. But this is a pseudo ACL laxity because the medial side I'll show you has, has collapsed. Uh, often they have pain, limp, and sometimes restricted movements. All of us have seen, you know, uh, grossly disturbed articular surfaces, but they still have a very good um, range of motion. So this is a relatively simple fracture, which sometimes you may be, um, you know, wondering whether should I fix this or not, because it seems like an undisplaced fracture. But these fractures will almost always displace. They will go down a little, as you see on the right side. Uh, leading to a significant enough clinical problem. So, how do you identify the problem? That is it some laxity in the joint that is causing that opening up or is it a malunited fracture? If you do a tracing of that, similarly, you do a tracing of the normal side and just flip it over and you will be able to see very clearly that it is the medial condyle which has uh, depressed, right? And if you are able to identify the problem, then correcting that problem is really not a big issue. You have to do a sort of oblique osteotomy which exits around the, uh, the tibial spines, raise that and put in a large tricortical uh, graft, a simple fixation, and that problem is solved. So now if you compare, what you see on the left side, the red outline is what was the pre-operative outline. And what you see on the right side is the post-operative x-ray picture with the pre-operative outline of the normal side. So we've restored normalcy and that problem is solved. So the operative technique for this kind of thing is to be minimally invasive if possible. Remember, minimally invasive does not mean a small incision. Minimally invasive sort of refers to the amount of injury you are causing to the soft tissue. So you can be minimally invasive with a large incision also. Oftentimes, if we can avoid it, we do not open the joint. Uh, you do a bone grafting and fixation as required. So this is a case who had uh, original sort of fracture line, something like this, and you can see that has gone down. Um, <clears throat> he has clinically a little bit of uh, varus, and the main issue was the instability, the leg sort of wobbling when he was walking. So I now, with, with the possibility of future TKRs, generally these incisions are uh, midline. All of the soft tissue, like you do for a TKR, is raised up, up to the joint line um, over there, uh, in this particular case, I also needed an additional osteotomy on the lateral side. So you'll see a small sort of uh, incision there to reach that portion. And then with a knowledge of where that fracture has been, oftentimes we need a CT scan to sort of understand this whole original fracture line. And then go sequentially, I'll show you again in another case also, with the osteotome into that what was the original fracture line and you can create, recreate that fracture even, you know, a year, year and a half later without any real trouble. And then that entire uh, part is, is raised uh, with the use of laminar spreaders or a thickish uh, wedge, osteotome a wedge like this, what you see in that picture. And keeping it spread open with a laminar spreader, you can fill it up with uh, graft. Once it's filled in with graft, this is very, very stable. 
and the fixation is basically just to sort of hold that graft um, in there. So you don't need a very elaborate uh, fixation for that. So now your um, alignment is, is good, your articular surface is um, restored. This guy was referred to me for a high tibial osteotomy. And this is what used to be uh, the problem a few years ago. This, this was done eight years ago. And, and then one was the use of um, screws, okay, to get this MIPO technique. But MIPO also has to be a stable fixation. And the other thing was our lack of recognition of the posterior medial fragment, which today we um, recognize. But anyway, this is how he healed after removal of the screws and the CT confirms that a lot of these areas are still not united. You can see the um, fracture line. So when you have a CT like this, you get a mental idea of where exactly the fracture line is and how you need to go. So this is like um, a summation of all the sort of things that were done for him. As I told you, recreate the fracture. And this is not a high tibial osteotomy because this osteotomy sort of exits somewhere here, leaving this portion as a hinge. And the whole thing is wedged open and that goes to that. Now you see this is still in a little bit of virus, but what we are aiming here is to restore his uh, normal side. And that's an eight year um, follow up. You see the normal side also in some amount of virus. This is also in some amount of virus and this guy just came incidentally. Uh, with another patient for a follow-up, right? So at some point, probably he may need, if he develops symptoms, he may need a high table osteotomy, but the idea is to restore. Now the other issue is that this is slightly wider than the opposite side, but if you look at it closely, on that side, that's the amount of opening, of, uh, how wide it is on the operated side, this is how wide it is. Is it really a you know big problem? I'm not so um, convinced that it is. And He's got good range of motion. Similarly, when you have fractures which are which we have which have an articular step, you may need to do uh, osteotomy in addition to this one on the lateral side to get both of the both of these aligned. So here, actually, the question that comes up is the is the problem the intraarticular step or is it the alignment? And if you actually see the literature, the bigger problem is the lack of alignment. The Proximal tibia tends to tolerate relatively uh, significant articular steps much better than, let's say, the ankle. So if you, if you have an articular step but your alignment is good, the patient may be uh, asymptomatic. So this is post-surgery. That is um, at one year. And here you will notice that we've got an improvement in his um, varus. That was with an osteotomy here, as well as the articular step, it's about the same, um, the same, same method that I showed you earlier. A little more complex in the sense that fracture is similar, but there's a lot more de uh, deformity. Things are tight. Even when I do a varus valgus view over here, there's mo not much of um, opening out. So in this particular case, I was not sure whether I can open it up in an acute fashion. So here we use um, a relatively simple frame just to create space for that fragment to be um, distracted. So basically, this tibial fragment is with the proximal, uh, with the distal femur. And so both of these are being distracted um, as a unit with a six axis, you are able to distract that and create some space there. And once that is done, it's our job to then re uh, sort of align the articular surface which you see here. Now if you look at sort of sequential pictures, under the fluoroscope you go with uh, different directions and you are able to free up this uh, fragment and then as I pointed out, you can uh, fix it up and this is the fixation on the, uh, this is the surface on the AP as well as the lateral. There is a big bump here which is non-articular. If you, I'll show you a little later. This one is, is what is the articular portion. 
Am I going ahead there? Yeah, okay. So this was the pre-operative and this is the post-op. This can be taken out um, if required, but this is not abutting. It allows him um, full extension. So there's no real reason to take that out. But if needed, that, that can be taken out. So even in depressed fractures, which, which this fellow was uh, three months old, you can raise these depressed portions if you have, if you've studied this carefully enough and elevate it, restore the um, joint line which prevents that valgus um, orientation in these. And in difficult situations like this one who was again about uh, four months old, grossly shattered, instead of opening this whole thing up, uh, we were able to get the articular surface restored uh, in a relatively closed fashion by punching up uh, appropriate areas. So on the AP as well as the lateral, you see the articular surface is well restored. And then it's, as I pointed out, it's a matter of getting it properly aligned. So he's healed in a slightly shortened position, but his alignment is good. His articular surface is good. And he's got good function. He's now about, I think, eight years again, continues to do well. So in conclusion, these patients, you should be able to recognize when it is an intra-articular problem. And these patients will not do well with a high tibial osteotomy. They should have an intra-articular uh, osteotomy and reconstruction. I've done them up to two years uh, post-injury. It's not really very difficult as long as you're able to understand where the fracture lines are, what needs to be um, elevated. It's not really um, a problem. Of course, what is going to be the long-term outcome in terms of 10 years and 15 years still remains to be seen. Thank you.